Hi, I'm Dr. John Biard, and I'm here today with a really good friend, Colleen Cannon, who, uh, gosh, I've known for almost 30 years. We used to compete together years ago as triathletes. She is an, was, is an amazing athlete. She was a two-time national champion uh, triathlete. She was the uh, world champion triathlete. She was the short course Shores national champion. I mean, she won just about every race there was to win. I mean, she's really, you know, in her time, she was clearly the best woman triathlete in the world for sure. And I am honored to have her here with us today. She um, has continued to be an athlete. She has continued to inspire uh, women a, a with her, her retreats that she does with women. I wanna talk about that a little bit later. Uh, she's such an inspiration to me. Uh, the very, very first uh, tape series uh, on athletics that I did was called the Invisible Athletics Course. It was on cassette, it was way back in the early 90s, put out right. by Nightingale Conan. And Colleen was on, I'm gonna show you a picture of this, she was on the cover of it. I mean, I think it was one of when, after she won, I think the Sprint National Championship. Um, so uh, I'm honored to have her here today. And as you know, I'm, a, I'm a really a big fan of uh, Alessa's more approach to exercise. And I thought that was uh, kind of a thing 20 years ago. And it turned out to be, I turned out to be very wrong. And more is better. And we're gonna talk about why maybe that's not better. Right. And, um, and uh, so I, I, I have a, a lot to talk to her about, about how we can, you know, inspire folks to not kill themselves and what the long-term benefits are. And just what Colleen has learned along the way as a professional triathlete and, you know, really a leader and inspiration for, for women's and, and women's health. And I'm just curious to know, like here's, you know, you know Colleen and I are both now in our 50s. Mm -hmm. um, we competed together. Um, I just wonder what your take is on, you know, the intensity that w was involved back then and, you know, the intensity and how it's sort of ramped up over the years and what your take is on all that. Yeah, it's kind of gone crazy. It's blown out of the water. I think when we were racing in the early 80s when triathlon, the first wave of triathlon came, we were the pioneers. So nobody knew what to expect, and we thought the Ironman was, oh my God, can you really do it? Yeah. That's really far. It's a 2.4 mile swim, it's 112 miles on the bike, and a marathon, like 26.2 miles running. So at that time, people thought we were crazy, right? And, um, but I think along that route, you know, that sport actually taught me. Um, it was a great vehicle for me to learn a lot about the body. I learned so much that being healthy is way more important. Um, it needs to go along right with being fit. Um, we, I learned about the mind and that it's like 100%, 99% a lot of the mind, how you're doing out there. And so I learned so much through the sport, but I think um, the craziness, the craziness that's going on now, I'm like, what is up? I, I don't really know because I'm, I'm seeing these people like, let's go five days without food and water. Let's go with one arm. Let's go, you know, until we die. And it reminds me of the Monty Python skit, kind of like, I'm not dead yet. Yeah. Well, let's just keep going. All right, I'm not dead yet. Yeah. Come on, you can do more. Yeah. And I don't understand it. Um, when I was racing, I think it was more, tried to be more balanced. And that's what I learned a lot from you, was I learned about meditation. I learned how to calm myself down. I learned how to restore myself so that I could go out and go hard when I needed to. Um, but I wanted to be healthy as well as fit. And I think that's a big key. Yeah. It's a really big key. You know, when I look back and I remember you, there was something special about Colleen. She was the happiest triathlete. <laughs> Maybe it was because she won them ever, but she everybody won. <laughs> she was like on top. She was, no, but she was so blissful and so joyful just about the whole thing. She was really, you know, it wasn't just about killing herself to win. You know, and I'm just curious, like, when you look now at some of the other triathletes that we competed with, you know, what's your take? I'm trying to send a message to the people who are doing CrossFit or killing themselves now, and they think that's going to be great in 20, 30 years from now. What are you seeing from the athletes back then in the 80s? How are they today? Well, you know, I haven't seen a lot of them, but the ones, you know, what's interesting is um, I've seen a lot of people with heart problems. Um, and maybe that's just not from listening to the heart. You know, you had that great... You have the listening phase and learning to tap in and tune into yourself. I think that's a big part of it. Yeah. Um, it's kind of like making a cake, right? You have this, the big, huge foundation of your cake. 
is that that the easy distance, the slower distance, learning how to new, new, you know get the good nutrition in your body, all of these things make this big cake, and then you kind of build your cake. Um, I think racing and going super hard all the time, it's like taking bites out of the cake. Yeah. And so pretty much, I think people are left with just crumbs. They're not, they don't even have any part of their cake left because they raced, they did anaerobic work all the time. They didn't go through the seasons like you're talking about. Um, they didn't eat with the seasons. They didn't train with the seasons. They just wanted to go hard all the time. And so what I did per, you know, this body mind sport book that you came out and before that, when you were talking about the listening phase and going easier, is that something that I really took to heart? And I did that and I did the meditations. I did it twice a day yeah. and I was really fortunate to meet you and to go to the East Coast and do Pancha yeah. Karma and meet yeah. Deepak. And it was really, um, it changed my life and I think it saved my life. In many ways because now I'm healthy I'm strong I'm I can go and do I'm probably just as fast now as I was then Wow um, I don't think I have that competitive spirit like I'm gonna go kill myself but um, now that people are out there and going hard 24 7 it's like the American way yeah they want to go more they want to do more they want to be more and um, I don't think that they understand that the resting is the most important part of the training you know, it's interesting is that the the Tarahumara Indians, right, from northern Mexico, they did, went down, they did a study on them, and, they, and they're the, these long distance runners. They run, you know, 25, 30, some say 50, 100, 150 miles on a day regularly. They're just, they're training and they're just long distance runners through the, the <laughs> Copper Canyon, which is the like most treacherous oh, yeah. terrain yeah. you could ever imagine. You know, uh, and there was a car once, there was an old story, so there was, was a car driving and there was a, they saw a Tarahumara running and they said, hey, you want to ride? And the Tarahumara said, no, no, I'm in a hurry. <laughs> <laughs> Because he wanted to make sure he got there, you know. And they, Forget and they, the car. Yeah, right. And um, so what was interesting about them, they did a study and had them do a marathon, which is like 26 miles, which was nothing for them. Yeah. But their heart rate, breath rate, everything when they finished the, the marathon was the same as when they started. It was no effort. And we now know that marathon runners, when they finish the race, they have the same damage to their heart as, as if they had a heart attack. So, right. so when you put that kind of wear and tear. Now, I think the point that we're trying to make is that you, I'm not, we're not saying you should just do very little. That I call it the eye of the hurricane effect. The bigger the calm, the more powerful the wind. And I think there's, the human body is unlimited in its potential. And you don't have to do nothing and do little. But if you do a lot and you kill yourself, the body's going to break down. You're going to wear out. You're going to be in big trouble. But if you create that eye, that calm, and then build the winds around the hurricane, man, the bigger the eye, the more powerful the winds. There's nothing we can't do. And, and that is, I think, what you were talking about earlier um, is about how you found that composure and calm. And how did that save you in your in in your career? Oh, it was huge. I mean, Mary Oliver says, what do you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? So knowing that, it kind of brought me back into my precious part of myself. Mm -hmm. You know, it tapped me into that quantum field where anything is possible, but it also, um, it's, you don't feel like you have to go do B. You know, like it, it, it quelches like that drive force yeah. because you're, you feel connected to everything in a way. So, um, even early in the triathlon, I remember when I was first learning to meditate and you were like, 20 minutes a day, twice a day, you're going to do this. And I'm just like, no way, I'm not going to sit down. And it was the best thing I ever did um, because I did. I built that reservoir. I built that a huge um, place to rest. I call it a resting place mm -hmm. because I, I knew that I could go in there at any time because I built this pathway so mm -hmm. that I can go in at any time calm and chill out, especially at the beginning of races, it really helped. Yeah. But this, um, it kind of let, let me tap into that precious part where I, I didn't, and it kind of set up like this little inner coach. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't actually go push myself beyond because I had a good conversation going all the time, twice a day. Wow. And when I first started doing it, I remember I would sleep through it. I was like, you know, does that count if I'm napping through <laughs> meditating? Right. And you're like, well, someday you won't do that, you know? So I think a few years, actually, it was within that year, I started going in and, and deepening with the practice and learning about how to calm the mind. Do you know that's, that's how I started? I don't know if you remember that story, but I was... Uh at listening before I wrote the book and I was listening I was in chiropractic college like in the really early 80s and I was doing triathlons I was training for an Ironman and I went to this Ayurvedic <laughs> lecture and, and, and it was all about Ayurveda and be peaceful and calm and you know and, and I went up to this guy and I said so what do you think about doing an Ironman or a triathlon he goes what is that and I told him what it was and he said why do you do why that why would you do that yeah and I was like ooh I had no idea I had nothing I had no I felt like such an idiot and then he, and I, and I said well 
you know, I didn't have an answer. And then he said, do you meditate? And I said, I do actually, I meditate every day. And he said, do you sleep while you meditate? And I was like, yeah, I get the deepest sleep. It's so good. And he looked at me like I was a complete idiot <laughs> and said, um, if you sleep when you meditate, it's because you're exhausted right. and you can't maintain what I read, what is called restful alertness. When you're meditating, your, your body is at rest, but your mind is alert. You're not sleeping. Right. Right. So, I, so, so I said, so that means if I train real hard and I can meditate and not fall asleep, it's good for me. If I fall asleep, it's bad. And he goes, yes. And I'm like, and he was like, now you can get out of here. So right. I, so I ran out of there and I started meditating more and training less and meditating even more and training less. I went on these retreats to, to do that. And um, actually I was, a, wow. I was a terrible, I was a mediocre, yucky triathlete. And, and I remember you know, I started meditating less and training more and, and I started competing better and better and better, started becoming competitive. And people were thinking that I was on steroids. I remember a lot of people were like, are you taking steroids? They didn't believe that I wasn't doing steroids. I'm like, no, I'm meditating. It's like the weirdest thing. And I'm training less, you know, right. it, was, it was just the most amazing thing. And it really, really locked into my my brain that less can be more mm -hmm. and there's a strategy to get there and that's something that that was really one of the first things like you said the meditation was that hey here's the little monitor and governor of how hard you are allowed to push without killing yourself and breaking something down making something permanent happen right you know? it, it gives you like this two-way dialogue it's like okay you you learn to go inside and listen and tune in and tap in and so you know not to push through that yeah. um, I think it was also you that said you know, your body has this fluids, these fluids, and when you push too much, it pushes that kidney energy, it pushes that system, so that it, it kind of drains your life force. I mean, we're talking, you're one wild and precious life. It's not, this right. is not a dress rehearsal. Right. So if you wanna go out there and push yourself and kill yourself, you're depleting, you're, you're hurting yourself. It's yeah. like, let's just beat ourselves up, man, just smack yourself with a hammer, you know? It's like, no, you wanna yeah. feel good, and after every workout, you wanna feel good. And when you tear yourself down, you're gonna rest, build yourself back up. So it, you do have a, you know, a tear down cycle. You have like the, the cycle that goes in its little rhythm, but you wanna make sure that the resting and the recovery is really part of that and just not pushing and pushing because eventually you're gonna plateau and really take a dive. Yeah, it's like pulling back the bow you were talking about earlier. Like if you don't pull back the bow, which means establish, you know, there's a, in Ayurveda there's a saying, it says establish being and perform action. And that's really like, the, if you were to boil Ayurveda, yoga, breathing, meditation, all down to four words, it's really that. Establish being, perform action. Being means silence. So establish silence and then perform your action. Don't perform action without having yourself steeped in the silence. You know, it's like pulling back the bow is the silence. Then you gotta let it go. And, but most people don't ever pull back the bow. We just go, 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 go until we just run out of gas. We don't have anything left to pull it back with. Then we become really deeply exhausted. And, and this is, we've talked about this the other day where I read that book called The Rise of Superman, which is the, the, the rise of extreme athletics and extreme sports. People are base <laughs> jumping off of Mount Everest and skateboarding over the Great Wall of China and having you know 10 seconds of brainwave coherence and euphoria and risking their life for it. Um, and that's the culture, and we sort of idolize these athletes, but at the, towards the end of the book, you realize that most of the athletes that they track through this book who have pretty amazing, cool stories, I have to say, like, you know, surfing off these crazy waves and stuff, a vast majority, like three quarters of the people they, that they're writing about in this book are dead, and the other guys are so beat up and broken down from beating themselves up that they can't produce the juice and the endorphins any longer to create the high, and they're depressed. I'm like, that's not how we're supposed to end up, no, right? No, I, I totally agree with you. I just don't understand it. I don't get it. I'm sure that people didn't understand me at the time when I was doing longer races. So I do have some compassion for it. But then I look at it and I'm like, it's a learning. It's a journey. So maybe you can go to the edge and make a new frontier, but you have to come back with like the hero's journey. You come back with the, the gifts. Yeah. And, you know, I learned a lot about myself and about the human body and what it can do. And I brought back the gifts. I guess if you're dead, <laughs> it's not working. There's, there's like, there's a finish line. Hello. It's like, um, you're not, you're crossing a different kind of finish line. So do you think people are just so locked into like, I don't understand it. Like, are they locked into the moment? Is it, is it instant gratification? Like, what is it do you think that drives you know, this culture to go so hard? Um, I think it's really interesting because I travel a lot and I go to these other places, other cultures, and everybody's way more relaxed. They have long lunches. They enjoy life. 
they, um, they're a strong community and everybody feels supported. And I come back to the United States and it's everybody's like for themselves and everybody's like aggressive. And I'm like, oh my gosh, what's going on here? And then, and then you watch television and it's reality TV. Yeah. I mean, oh my God. Yeah. So it's like people are not even real. They're not tapping in to, to themselves at all. So they keep running and going and doing, and I don't know what they want to become because they're not even really kind of sourcing who they are. They, I don't know what they're running from, um, you know, it, but if you run like that, it's that fight or flight system. So right. that's gonna burn you out. Right. And I, I don't really know because I haven't really talked to any of these people, um, but I do know that in the sport of triathlon that I was in, in the elite level, that people were pushing themselves um, I think there were issues. There's always issues. There are emotional issues that have to be looked at. Right. And when you settle down and you become okay with yourself and you develop this peaceful place within, you don't have to, it's not like it's a me or you, you feel connected to everything. So it's not like, wait a minute, I don't have to go push. I'm, I'm fine right here where I am. It's an interesting thing you say that because like in Ayurveda, we know that we grow up, we start our life as kids with the desperate desire for approval from our parents. And we either get it or don't get it, right? Mm -hmm. And if we don't get it, we we take our raw material and then we try to muster up a personality that will get them to like us or love us or approve of us. Right. You know, So if we wandered into the jungle without caring about mom and dad's approval, um, we could eat by a lion, there'd be no people here. <laughs> so that's like a hard wire needing that approval of mm -hmm. mom and dad. And what humans do, animals, they just like, at some point, mama lion said, okay, I'm going north, you're going south, you're on your own, I'm not gonna watch over you anymore, you're on your own, dude. Yeah. Where humans, we just replace mom and dad with, you know, coffee and shopping and, and stimulants and, right. and we take whatever raw material we have and we drive that to get some res return on investment, some feeling of safety and security or, or whatever. And I think a lot of athletes, I mean, they're really phenomenal athletes, so they take that and they run with it. Some people take you know, their intellect and they run with that. Mm -hmm. Some people are just really good pleasers, they can make people happy and they run with that. So that, that's the interesting mm -hmm. thing is like what you said is like, we're running from what, what are we running from? And, and it's not even, even just athletics. I think like you said, it's our entire culture. You come back from like Costa Rica and it's like, what is going on here? People are like, you, like, you get like, like, <laughs> like, what am I doing here? <laughs> yeah, like you can't even handle the, the intensity and the speed right. of it all, you know? And I think that's a great thing for people to just self-reflect. And, and that's why, you know, all these yoga, breathing, meditation, all these tools of, you know, establishing the being part, mm -hmm. the science part are so critical. So you have a little self-awareness to know uh, I, how and when you're pushing yourself and when you're addicted to, you know, stimulating yourself either with, you know, stimulants or exercise or money mm -hmm. or power or fame or shopping or, you know, I mean, that's a really good self like oh, inquiry. Like, right. okay, what is, when you get stressed out, your brain pulls down the menu. Is it dark chocolate? Is it popcorn? Go to the movies? <laughs> like, where do you go to get satisfied? And how can we can't just be satisfied? Like the Tara Hamara, they sit around, like my kids went down there for like a, for a thing and they were like, Dad, they just sit around and they do nothing all day. They play the guitar, they let the sheep out, they sit down, they play the guitar again, they let the sheep out. They don't do anything all day and they're like completely happy. You know, he, like, and they have all their stuff, all their needs are met. Like in America, like we're racing like 90 miles an hour going crazy and nobody's happy in like life for in terms of survival, like they have it like really together. Oh, yeah. They just play guitar all day. Yeah. Yeah. They don't have the stress and they're inspired to play the guitar. So yeah. they, they, you said something that I think was really important when you have action, when you sit and meditate or when you do find the quiet place within yourself and you could run and kind of get the brain synchronized and do that, but you find like an inspired action. So it's just not pushing because the culture is pushing you because you find what you love and you follow that. Yeah. But if you can't tap in, you can't find that resource of what makes you happy and follow that bliss. You know, like what Joseph Campbell said, he said, follow your bliss, but I don't think he was ready for <laughs> yeah. cliff jumping off Everest, maybe. Whoa. Well, that's like 10 seconds of bliss. <laughs> and if you don't get it, you die. But you got, you know, we guarantee you 10 seconds of bliss, but we can't guarantee you're gonna live. Yeah, right. sorry about that, <laughs> right. you lose. So if you were gonna tell someone to say, okay, look, it's all about passion. I think like that's such a great insight. How would you tell someone, a young person who's like in CrossFit, like, would you tell someone about that? Like, if I'm like across, I'm 22 years old, I'm, I'm a young triathlete, which I'm not, 
and I'm not 22 either, but what if I was, and I was mm -hmm. doing CrossFit, and I'm just, you know, I'm really super fit, and I have all this physical potential, what are you gonna tell me to do? How would you direct me? Well, probably the way that you directed me, which was chill out, or let's give you some tools, let's give you some things that can actually help you um, so that you can do this forever. And go within, you know, there's a period for this anaerobic, trainings crossfitish kind of time of year but it's not all year so and you want to have the base you want to have your foundation cake really built well you want the foundation of your house built well um and i learned that with racing you have to go through those phases of training so that means like balanced lifestyle balanced lifestyle um it talk you know aerobic training you know your physical training so you know you have to know how to like go more um, slower down slow down and build the foundation so that your muscles ligaments and tendons can actually handle the stress that you're going to put on them mm -hmm. and build the little capillary beds and so that they can be little shopping malls in your legs i don't know if that's making a good analogy or not but um you basically well, want to have more good, blood so you can do yeah. more longer basically right, <laughs> right. Without, without the right. wear and tear yeah. yeah yeah and it can take out the waste and right. so that you and you basically when you train like that and you're in that listening phase you won't hurt your body right. you're not going to push yourself through and, and hurt yourself you're not going to tear yourself down as much you still will and you still need to repair but it's you, know, you kind of relax within the stress mm -hmm. so that when you're in a stressful situation be it you know someone dies or you know in a bad you know, anything on the freeway or if you're in a race you can handle it better mm -hmm. you actually have the resources within you to to handle it so i would tell them to first slow down um, get some other tools in their little tool bag like meditation like some de-stressing techniques like using the mind learning how to actually open and use the mind with visualization and creative ways in that regard um, and you know that it's um, because I think what people are doing with the CrossFit are like they only have their hour to train so they want to go harder that's not necessarily the smartest way to do it yeah. um, you want to maybe find some stress reduction but is this really stress reduction or is it adding more stress Right. You know, if you had a bank account, you know, and you were putting like energy into your bank account, you have to say, what's taking energy out of my bank account and what's going to put it in? So, you know, meditation is going to put money in your bank account. Good food is going to put money in your bank account. Aerobic training is going to put it in your bank account. And when you go hard and you're stressed out, it takes it out. Sugar takes it out. Coffee takes it out. All this stuff is like draining your bank account. Yeah. Racing takes it out. Jumping off the mountain, you know, could like totally drain your bank account. Yeah. So all of these Ayurvedic principles are adding money and life force into your bank account so that you can create with. It's like, I call it like the wind horse energy, the strength mm -hmm. of the wind and the power of the horse. And wow. if you, have, you don't have this life force energy, you can't create in your life. So at Women's Quest, we try and help people rebuild this life force and the prana and the mana and all that energy mm -hmm. in the body. And you're not going to create. You're not going to be able to, to create anything with no energy. You know, so then you try and drink more caffeine and that's not working. Then you like, oh, I need antidepressants. That doesn't work. So people have got to stop the madness. I mean, you have to stop. You have to stop, tune back in. And I think it does kind of start with um, just taking some time to be good to yourself and to smile. Now, one of, yeah, which, <laughs> which one of the techniques that, that we taught a long time ago, and there's some pretty cool new research on it right now, is the nose breathing. Right. So tell me how that worked for you oh back in the day. And, and I know that, you know, as a competitive athlete, it's always a challenge to actually incorporate that. So, but I'm curious to, to know how it, how it worked for you. No, the nose breathing, the nose, the nose breathing was actually awesome. And luckily I have a really big nose, so it, it worked, <laughs> but I also live at altitude. So I lived at like 8,000 feet. And I remember calling John, I'm like, John, I'm not able to get out. I can't even go into any other phase because I'm into my performance phase, my listening phase, and I would be at a certain heart rate. And um, it actually helped me so much that things that I didn't even know now that I found out with the breathing was it was basically balancing, I think my right and left brains, it was balancing me. Yeah. As soon as I would go into the um, listening phase where I had to breathe through my nose, I was, it would put me in kind of an altered state, I would say, really quickly, almost like the meditative state, um, but I was active. So I would be active in that state and my runs would, I would go into the next performance phase without even any, any kind of exertion. You know, I have to pull energy from the body to go faster. It flowed, it went faster. So then I learned how to kind of tap that vein 
so that when I got into races, I could tap that and I could go so much faster. So in heart rate, it would be like at a heart rate of maybe my uh, performance phase, right? That was the next phase. That would be in like maybe, I would be able to get into like maybe 150s in that zone. Mm -hmm. And at my heart rate in that zone would be um, 150, but I would maybe be running like an eight minute mile. I would, I was able to drop that minutes per mile to about six. So when I would get into a race and I was six race, yeah, at wow. the same, because I trained that way. Right. So then when I get into a, a triathlon, it's, it really helped me perform well because I could go well into five thirties without any stress. Wow. So I think because I built that foundation through the listening phase and learned how to do the nose breathing, it, it opened up so much more potential inside me. So I don't know if that makes sense. Oh my, I mean, it's, I mean I'm, like, I'm, I'm just salivating here. It's like more potential. No, because I mean, what you, everything that you said, we have actually science to back up what you said. One of the, and I'm just going to try to recap what so you said. Cool. We, we did studies, we, we actually measured what's called perceived exertion in terms mm-hmm. of, you know, zero to 10, how do you feel during the exertion? And when people are mouth breathing, they're at a 10 out of 10. When they're right. nose breathing, they're at a four out of 10. Right. So you're at a four out of 10, doing the same work as someone next to you doing a, doing a 10 out of 10, or the same that you were used to be doing at a 10 out of 10. So she could all of a sudden go from an eight minute mile at 150 beats per minute to a six minute mile or a five and a 530 minute mile. That's crazy fast at 150 beats per minute. That's right. really, really efficient. That's doing a lot more with a lot less effort. And that's a lot less wear and tear. We also measured that the brain wave, when you breathe through your nose, they go into an alpha state, which is a meditative calm. This is crazy. The same <laughs> brain wave that these base jumpers do when they jump off of Mount Everest yeah. or they skateboard over, you know, risk their life over the Great Wall of China, whatever, and sometimes even die doing it. The same exact brainwave pattern we reproduced in our research, which was published in the England International Journal of Neuroscience, was published study that showed that we can actually produce brainwave coherence and alpha during vigorous exercise with your mouth closed, breathing through your nose. So, which means you can also get it meditating. So if you can get it meditating, create the eye of the hurricane, you can do it while you're training, create a bigger eye of the hurricane, then all of a sudden the result of that is you're pulling back the bow so far, is when you let it go, it's gonna go faster. And that's exactly what happened to you, right? Right. You're, you're, I could go way faster without the stress. Yeah. And that's and this is exactly right. my point. And when I read that book, Rise of Superman, I just got so sick to my stomach that 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 I thought no pain no game was over 20 years ago, but it didn't. It didn't end. It, it got worse. You know, I, I looked up after six kids. I went, Oh my God, it's worse than it was. I gotta call Colleen and get her in here and, and, and inspire there's the world. Hope. There's hope. There's <laughs> right, hope. Right. Right. Yeah. And and so that so what you're saying and what you experienced is actually documented by science and it's a published experience that you're having. And, and I didn't know that, by the way. I didn't yeah, know that. Yeah. No, I know you I'm didn't like, know that. <laughs> and because when we did the tapes, it was when I was when I worked with Delina, it was the tapes. It was before Body My Sport even came out. The research wasn't even done yet. Right. So we were actually in the process of doing that research way back then. And and and, and there's more. We know that when you breathe through your nose, it activates this this vagus nerve in your heart. The same one that is the, that we now know is the river or the road or the track that your bugs communicate with your brain with all the microbiology. Wow. It's the same exact track. And when you activate that, it creates a neurological hum. And I just wrote a new article about this based on your research just yesterday. I wrote this article because now not only does the breathing through your nose activate a calm and handle stress and a repair from the stress better and more endurance and more calm and more enjoyment and more bliss and more euphoria and more brainwave patterning. But what it also does, which is brand new research, it actually supports health. They measure anxiety, depression, heart disease, blood pressure. And I just wrote this article about all these health benefits that you get from doing that. So we're talking about now, and I know you didn't really want to say anything bad about how a lot of triathletes got older and didn't do so well. <laughs> she was very, very discreet about that, very, but tactful about that. But the reality is, yeah. is that a lot of elite athletes, not just in the world of triathlete, but a lot of athletes who push themselves so far, they don't do that great when they get older. No. It isn't a long, they're not, it's not a long-sighted plan. It's a short-sighted plan. You gain the benefit while you're there, you reap the glory, and you pay down the road later on. And you don't ever see those folks, you know what I mean? They don't show up on right. TV or whatever, you know, and that's, un- but, but they're there and they're struggling. And what, what we're saying is that this concept of less is more, creating the eye of the hurricane, using meditation, oh breathing, living, what Colin was saying, living with the cycles of nature, being with the seasons, it allows you to create a, low, a level of calm, which is a documented experience now for not only experiencing life and health and exercise better, more euphoria, be, go faster, 
but also your health. And that blew my mind. I literally just wrote that article on the plane last night. Um, so it was just like, and I was like awesome. so excited about it. So anyway, that's the new research about the benefit of what you experienced. And here you are, 30 years later, you look like yeah. you're 20. She says, you can run as fast. I can't imagine you can still run as fast as you used to. Yeah. That's crazy. But, you know, it really proved that what Colleen, you know, naturally has, obviously, a lot of bliss and a lot of joy, and she's so balanced. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, she, and great, and, and what an inspiration for, for women to really listen to her story. And, uh, and she has a program called Women's Quest where she does uh, retreats for women to learn more about how to reconnect and connect and do everything you're saying. And, I, and I, want, I want to know more about that. What can you tell us about that? Well, I took most everything I learned from racing and training, a lot of it from you. Um, I took it into, I decided that I really wanted to help women because I was in Boulder, Colorado. And the, so it was the end of like 1992 and they were doing a Hopi Indians were gathering and they were giving the prophecy for 2012. And um, at the end, um, seven of them kind of surrounded me and they said, women will save the planet. Cause I was the only one left in the auditorium. And I was just like, we're gonna all die. <laughs> They're all gonna be base jumping. No. <laughs> What's going to happen to us? And uh, so I said, I got to do something. So I stopped racing and I started Women's Quest to help inspire women to learn how to, wow. how to actually train physically right. And that there's an athlete within every single person. It's not just doesn't matter your shape, your size, your age. Anyone can do it. Anybody can be healthy. And then to help train them to their heart's desire, to help them find the passion within, um, to teach them the right nutrition, mm -hmm. um, to introduce them to stress-free what it can be like and to what it feels like to feel good and that they can do and be anything they want and the meditation and the nutrition and um, we do some emotional help along the way i'm not i don't actually do that myself because i'm not a therapist but we we have access to really good people that help with our staff is fantastic mm -hmm. so it's um and now i've expanded from the united states so we go to costa rica to surf we do hiking in peru um, we have a trip in Hawaii next week, which is Hawaii. We swim with the dolphins, the wild dolphins, because they're basically my real family. <laughs> and um, yeah, she's a, we do she's yoga. a water spirit. For yeah, sure. I love to swim. Uh, so it's we do Italy, which is Tuscany, cycling and yoga. All of our retreats have the, the physical side of it. So we might do hiking or um, cycling or mountain biking or horseback riding or something like that. And we combine it with the kind of like the balanced approach with meditation and how to eat right and some lectures and um, kind of the soft side. So it's just not um, pushing and going, yeah. but we give them good educational things as well on here. You're gonna have this experience, it might be in Peru, mm -hmm. but we're gonna give you wow. that experience, plus we're gonna also offer connection with these people and then we're gonna tell, you know, meditate with them and sit with them. And, Look at their cultures. Well, I had no idea that's how you started it all. What a great yeah. mission and a great reason to do everything you're doing. And and you have to, have to go to her website, womensquest.com, right? Mm -hmm. So womensquest.com, go to her website, check it out, check out what she does. She's, you know, she's an amazing inspiration. She's got so much to offer us and teach us all. And I'm, and I'm just so happy to have reconnected with you. And uh, I bumped into her in the pool of, over the summer <laughs> yeah. with my kids. And she's like, we had like four of our kids in the lane were trying to get some room. And she goes, and she moved over. And I was like, Colleen? <laughs> I know. I hadn't seen her in how many years it must have been? It's at least oh, 20 yeah, years Yeah, right? So. Here she was. Because now all our kids, all his kids are grown up. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's amazing what John has done. He's my hero. He's my hero. And the, that he's on the forefront and the cutting edge of all this new information and that he continues to bring it forward is like... I'm always interested to find out what he's got going the next week. I'm like, whoa, dude. And because it's right up my alley of wellness and anti-aging and feeling good forever. So yeah, I think that's the key, really. I mean, as we get older, you start to really look down the road and go, I love, you know, I love exercise. I love being active. I love feeling good in my body. And I don't want it to end, you know? Right. And also you want to It doesn't continue, have to. And you want to continue to, to evolve and grow emotionally. So you're, so the mind, our crazy mind, which usually is what takes us out, you know, we get worried and stressed out and stuff. That, you know, you can really continue to grow emotionally and grow physically. Maybe not run, I can't run as fast as I used to, but mm -hmm. I sure feel like I'm more fit and healthier in so oh, many yeah. ways. You know what I mean? I'm so much healthier now yeah. than I was, even when I was racing. Yeah. Um, you know, I thought I was at the pinnacle of health, but it was the pinnacle of health to push myself. Yeah. <laughs> now I'm healthy, just more well-rounded. I feel like I'm healthy in the body, mind, and spirit. I'm just kind of like, 
I'm more in tune. Yeah. Well, and maybe that comes with age, but well, there's no such thing as age, right? You are always <laughs> the one in tune, and she still is. And, you know, I think we all have a, a lot to learn from, uh, from Colleen. So please check that out at womensquest.com. Thank Thanks, you so John. much for, for joining us. Thank you. Awesome. <laughs> this recording is brought to you by Life Spa, where ancient Ayurvedic wisdom meets modern science. Get access to free health video newsletters by Dr. John at lifespa.com. These statements have not been evaluated by the FDA. These products are not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease.